I said, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what it is your generation is struggling with and why. And I hear a lot of your young people in your generation are really struggling with anxiety. True or false? They all said to a person, true. And I said, why? And all of them, all of these, five or six, four or five, six teenagers, can't remember exactly how many it was, all of them, high school students, co early college, had different reasons, but all of them had anxiety. The world is turned upside down. This was before COVID. The world was turned upside down. They couldn't make sense of everything that was happening. They didn't know if they had a future. They didn't think that they could keep up. They weren't as gifted, weren't, weren't as attractive, gifted, smart, talented as their peers. They didn't feel like they measured up. So the stress of social media, which I reassured them a lot of that was fake. So I kind of gave them a little point, a few pointers. I said, look, I'm in the time, you know, it was 52, whatever it was. Let me give you a few pointers real quick at the end of the conversation. Most of what people are putting on there is not in context. It's fake. You're striving for a false standard that they've set, these people. Anyway, I kind of gave them a little fatherly lecture after they told me their honesty. But to a person, they were struggling with anxiety. And then I asked them, is this one reason why young people are turning to things like, you know, prescription drugs that are being manufactured, you know, and, 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 and duplicated by the drug cartels and put into the country to relieve this anxiety? And indeed it was. And I guess the point I'm making before we get into our program today is many, many young people of all backgrounds, from strong Christian families to families that are not Christians, to families that are very, very wealthy, to families that aren't very wealthy, these young people today are struggling. Look, you and I, Dr. Woods, talk to adults that are struggling with what's happening in the world. You and I talk to people that are Christians, and they understand what's happening from a Christian prophetic position but they're still struggling with what's happening because who who wouldn't i mean look at this and say wow and then when you take a young person who's so young and doesn't have a biblical worldview doesn't have a prophetic understanding doesn't have the context maybe isn't a believer and you start uh, or they are but they're you know young in their faith you know, your heart breaks for today's young people and the fact that so many of them are struggling with insecurities and with anxiety and fear and how we as Christians have the answers. And we need to be reaching out to these young people. What say you, Dr. Wood? Well, I haven't seen the interview yet, but I'm not really clear on why the president was laughing. I mean, it doesn't really seem to be a laughing matter. I mean, if somebody dies, I mean, is that the normal reaction? You start laughing? Well, so Marjorie, help, help. Marjorie Taylor Greene had brought her to testify. And, and um, he didn't like the fact that it was implied that it happened under his administration. So in the context of the interview, uh, he made a state, or in the context of, the, of, I guess, being interviewed or a question being asked of Biden, he made a comment that this happened in the last president, under the last president, and laughed about it, chuckled about it. Well, it did happen under his administration because he has a borderless mindset, unlike the prior president who was trying build a wall, you know, around the United States. So it's a shift in policy that's caused this fentanyl crisis. And so he, he shouldn't be laughing. He ought to be repenting in sackcloth and ashes. And he ought to go back to the Donald Trump playbook and see what actually has worked. And he ought to become a nationalist instead of a globalist. Now, Amen. I, th I think that would be the normal reaction rather than, than laughing at somebody's kids dying. So, I, you know, I'm just beside myself. Yeah. Well, wait till you see the interview with this dear lady <clears throat> and her heartbreaking. And here's, again, a pro-life person putting her money where her mouth is and literally saying, I'm so pro-life, I'm going to go adopt these two kids. And she did. And she's just sobbing as if she had given birth to them because they were her sons, uh, oh, wow. adopted sons. And uh, anyway, it's it's a testimony in many regards. I hope you will go watch it and then pray for Rebecca. All right, well, let's transition. Uh, let's transition to your topic today. We're going to go to some PowerPoint here and go through as much as we can. Here is what we're going to talk about today. As time allows, we'll get through as much as we can. Israel's covenant, Gog, Magog, Babylon, all updates, New World Order, surveillance society, persecution, societal signs. Now, these points seem very similar. So I think what you do, Dr. Woods, you, you oftentimes will take the same points, but you're updating them each week, right? Well, I wouldn't say that. Um, there's a lot of 
similarities in my teaching from week to week because I see the same themes. Right. That's that's why they look similar. So a lot of the themes will carry from one to the next. But believe it or not, I don't I don't use the same themes every week. Okay. So this is they, just what's what's popping in the news. I know we talk about Gog Magog a lot. We've talked a lot about Babylon and persecution. So what you're saying is when you look at the news, these are the, these are the things that keep popping up. Yeah, when I started studying prophecy, I started to see categories. Okay. And when you look at the news, it starts fitting into different prophetic categories. And that's where that outline comes from. All right, let's look at those categories. We come back. Dr. Andy Woods, his website, andywoodsministries.org, andywoodsministries.org. Now it's time to bring peace to the Middle East, says the EU. How does it fit in with what's going on, Dr. Woods? I think he's Category. muted. There we go. Now you're back. Go ahead. Yeah, earlier we were talking about categories, prophetic categories, and one of the prophetic categories is in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, which indicates the event that starts the tribulation period will be a peace treaty between the Antichrist and unbelieving Israel. The nearest antecedent to the he in Daniel 9, 27 is a, a man that's prof predicted in verse 26, Titus of Rome. So what the Bible anticipates is a Eurocentric uh, world figure that we call the beast or the Antichrist will start the tribulation period by entering into a treaty with unbelieving Israel. So that's why I found this particular article, you know, very interesting. It fits the category. It deals with a Italian ambassador. And his perspective is, come on, EU, let's get, let's get the, the ball rolling here get into the Middle East and fix it. Well, that's exactly what Daniel chapter 9, verse 27 anticipates. And so this is very clearly stage setting for that, that coming treaty by my way of thinking. Wow, excellent. Um, is there any other? Let's see, let's see. Um, Gog Magog. Gog Magog next. Daniel 9, uh, 27 is what we were looking at. He'll make a covenant for one week for a short period of time. They break it, Daniel 9, 27. All right, let's go to Gog, Magog, Revelation 9, 13 through 16. And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, one saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. And the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and the day and the month and year were released so that they might kill a third of mankind. And the number of the armies of the horsemen was 200 million. I heard the number of them. And uh, Dr. Woods, tell me the significance here uh, of what we're discussing, please. Well, you've got in Bible prophecy three uh, powers that will become hostile to the West and Israel in particular in the last days. Rosh or Russia, Persia or Iran, and also the kings of the East, you know, and I try to give some explanation there. Uh, that I think the kings of the East is China. And so what do you see in the news constantly? You see those three powers demonstrating a hostile intent towards Israel. In fact, the first article I gave you there talks about how Persia or Iran is about to reach um, uranium, uranium enrichment they're currently at 84%. Yeah, here, here's the article. Iran uranium enrichment reaches 84%. IAEA seeks answers. Inspectors needed to determine whether Iran intentionally produced the material or whether the concentration was an unintended accumulation which the network within the network of pipes connecting the hundreds of vast spinning centrifuges used to separate the isotopes, Bloomberg reports. Um, I think we know it's intentional, don't we, Dr. Woods? Well, sure, especially when in Shiite Islamic uh, theology, you're allowed to lie as long as you're advancing the purpose of Allah. And they believe that they need to create intentional chaos in the world in order for the, I think it's the 12th Imam, you know, to return to planet Earth. And these are the people that are about to get their hands on a nuclear device. And what the article talks about is once you have uranium enrichment of 90%, you know, 84% is not that far from 90%. You've got the bomb, you know, you're in bomb country. And so it's not surprising to read this because Ezekiel 38 
predicts an aggressive Persia or Iran in the last days. And if all of those powers are going to arise and come against Israel, they should start cooperating with each other. And that's why in the second article, it says Iran joins China in dredging Russia's Volga River. There we go. There it is. So there you've got Iran, China, and Russia all cooperating with each other. And as they dredge, uh, as they um, do this dredging of the river, the article talks about how each of these three political powers are going to benefit economically. So, you know, there it is right there on your front pages of your papers, the cooperation between the identical three powers that the Bible predicts will be hostile towards Israel in the last days. We see them hostile towards Israel, hostile towards the West, and cooperating with each other to the point where they're economically benefiting each other. Babylon. So we've covered Israel's covenant, Gog Magog, now Babylon. Revelation 17, 18, the woman whom you saw is the great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. There's a map of Babylon. We see it. Um, all right. Then we got Dubai. Tell me the connection between that you're making between Dubai and Babylon, please. All right. Well, the big argument against the view that you and I both share, right. that Babylon destined to enjoy a resurgence and move into global prominence in the last days, albeit Revelation 17 and 18. The big argument against that is, well, how could a city arise that fast right. in that part of the world? Well, that argument is being refuted every time you pick up the newspaper. We have this um, Abrahamic family house. Abraham, the tie that binds Judaism Roman Catholicism and Islam um, being built in Dubai overnight. And Dubai, when you look at that map you had up there a little earlier, is very, very close to Babylon. So obviously a city of that stature, the headquarters of a one world religion, which is what Revelation 17 verse 18 anticipates, um, it's a very credible scenario that the world's religions will move back to that ancient city. It's already happening in nearby Dubai. The same kind of thing is happening in Neom, Saudi Arabia, with the city called the Line. That's all kind of old news, Brandon, but the one that really struck my attention is this article from the sun.com, mm -hmm. and it says, uh, inside an incredible plan for a futuristic Saudi metropolis known as the new Maraba with a towering 1,300 square foot virtual reality cube. And um, what's so interesting about that is they're building this city that looks like a cube in Saudi Arabia. And Satan, of course, is um, a great imitator. We know that according to Revelation 21 and 22, there's going to descend from the heavens to planet Earth, a city that looks like a cube that's called the New Jerusalem. It looks to me like Satan is building his uh, counterfeit cube. There's the cube that God is going to bring. Um, and if you have a chance to, to look at that article from the sun.com, there's an actual video footage there. Oh, is there really? This, uh, this cube city, you know, is going to be like, it, it's a city just like Dubai, just like Neom, that's that's arising right out of the desert at a rapid rate. And my point is, if it could happen in Saudi Arabia, which is close to Babylon, if it could happen in Dubai, which is close to Babylon, why is it so hard to anticipate that the same thing is about to happen in the literal city of Babylon? Yeah, absolutely. The significance is, if it can happen that fast in Saudi Arabia, why can't it happen in Babylon? Well... And and as you and I know, the, the what is it called? The Gulf Fall Port? The Fall Port? Yeah. That's, we'll discuss that real quick because, folks, that's fascinating what's happening in Babylon. They say it will make it the global commercial site of the whole Middle East or the world. We'll be right back. Well, the argument for a long time is, well, Babylon is landlocked and all that nautical imagery, you know, that we see in Revelation 18. You know, the ship, the ship uh, masters, etc., cetera, um, sort of grieving at the destruction of Babylon because their prophets went away. I mean, what we've been told forever is, well, this can't be literal Babylon. 
because literal Babylon today is landlocked. Well, I think that's about to change <laughs> with this canal that they're, you know, thinking of building, you know, right through um, Iraq. And it's also going to deflate the argument that Babylon is just a kind of an insignificant tourist city. It has no economic power. Well, that article demonstrates that once, the, once this canal is built, um, Babylon is destined to be become very prominent economically. And so all these silly man-made arguments that are thrown against our view of a literal view of Babylon are being deflated if people would just pay attention to the headlines. Here's the article from The Cradle. <clears throat> Iraq's Silk Road port and canal project set to transform Baghdad's geopolitical clout, January 31st, 2023. And I went through this the other day uh, on television in great detail. It's a $2.6 billion contract uh, Baghdad signed with South Korea's uh, Do Wu Engineering and Construction. Begins operations. It's going to actually, it's in construction now since 2020, but it's going to begin operation in 2024, completed by 2025. And then they go on to talk about how big it is. How big it is. With 99 berths, Grand Fall will be West Asia's largest port, surpassing Jebel Ali port in the United Arab Emirates, which only has 67 container berths. <clears throat> they go on to talk about what it'll mean on a global scale. And boom, now all of a sudden, you've got, you've got Babylon, this thing running through Babylon, through Iraq, and you've got it uh, being a major global site for commerce. Hmm, that's what the Bible says is going to happen, right? Yeah, and all, all of our critics have said, oh, come on, Babylon is just a tourist site. It has no economic power. And so that's why I found this particular article very instructive. Well, it may be a tourist site only today, but that's about to change. And that should surprise us because that's exactly what God's word predicted for the last day. So there's no reason not to take Babylon, you know, as literal Babylon. And by the way, Brandon, they used to make the same argument about Israel. You know, oh, how can you guys take these prophecies about Israel literally? Don't you know there's nothing over there but sand and desert, you know, pre 1948. Well, obviously, people that thought that were, are kind of eating their hats. And so the same thing is about to happen with all of these, uh, all the geography concerning Babylon. Yeah, let's talk about the New World Order next <clears throat> in our list of things. Uh, Daniel 7.23, the fourth beast will be a fourth kingdom on the earth, which will be different from all the other kingdoms and will devour the whole earth. The Biden administration is in the process of throwing away our sovereignty to this world hell, you know, organization all under the guise of we need unelected bureaucrats to micromanage us with all of their mandates and vaccine requirements and mask mandates. Um, we need them to micromanage our lives, even though we don't vote for them in the in the name of protecting protecting us from the next pandemic, which we both know will not be a pandemic. It will be a pandemic. Yeah. But isn't that what the tribulation is? Really kind of hell come to earth? I mean, you've got demons being released. You've got all kinds of things. I mean, that is this not setting the stage for, for what is described as almost a literal hell on earth during the tribulation? When God um, disrupted the language at the Tower of Babel, he says, if I don't do this, it's in Genesis 11, nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible for them. And what he's talking about there is the potential for evil. And if there's only one government on the face of the earth and that government falls into the wrong hands, which, which prophecy clearly tells us it will, it'll fall into the hands of the Antichrist, that will literally be hell on earth. There will be a form of tyranny which will be uh, unstoppable because God set up the nation state as sort of a, check and balance system against runaway global tyranny. That's what the whole Tower of Babel account is about. And Satan's goal is to erase that. And that's happening right now as our sovereignty is being surrendered to this world hell organization. And if you think there's hell on earth now, you ain't seen nothing yet. Wait till that final form of tyranny arises and it falls into the hands of the Antichrist. You'll see, you'll see evil, which literally cannot be stopped.
Let's go to Surveillance Society. Surveillance Society in our list here. Surveillance Society. And Revelation 13, 16 through 18, of course, describes the mark of the beast. You can't buy or sell. We now hear them talking openly about 15-minute cities, where if you go outside of that, you could be penalized. Your money won't work. Everything else is going to cost you more. So it's, again, basically, welcome to the digital uh, ghetto. Like they put the Jews in a ghetto. This is what they're going to do. They're going to put you in a digital ghetto. And um, that's the 15-minute city. And we've talked about that here. He's talking uh, about it with this graph from the World Economic Forum and an article. What, we, let's go to talk about surveillance. Let me go to this article you've got over here on surveillance, because here we have an article from the Gateway Pundit again. Leaked ATF documents reveal the Biden regime's scheme to close gun stores across the country. Again, this goes all along with this whole idea of surveillance and, of course, disarming the American people, because if you don't have the Second Amendment, they can get away with it. One of my shows the other day, I titled it, People with AR-15s Don't Get on Trains. People with AR-15s Don't Get on Trains. You have the Second Amendment, you're not getting Americans on trains. Yeah, you know, the a lot of people think the Second Amendment is there to, you know, protect our rights to go hunting. <clears throat> You know, nothing could be further from the truth. When you look at Joseph Story's commentary on the Constitution, a very uh, uh, commentary created not long after the founding era, he basically says in there that the Second Amendment is the last defense against runaway tyranny. And yet people need to understand this, that the Constitution is in the way of the New World Order. And that's why these guys that are pushing for maximum global government are trashing it over and over again. That, that's why they ignore Article 2, Section 2, which I mentioned earlier about the how the president can enter into a treaty. They ignore that by calling these treaties executive agreements. And as you can see from that Gateway Pundit article, they're ignoring it in the area of the Second Amendment. The goal is to disarm the population. The New World Order is not going to allow you to be armed any more than Fidel Castro in Cuba, you know, would allow his citizens to be armed. Under this surveillance, here we have from uh, Activist Post, Biden appoints member of the Trilateral Commission to head the World Bank. Tell me about this article, how it fits with surveillance society, please. Well, that's uh, one of your friends, uh, our friends, Patrick Wood. Right. And he wrote that book there that you can see trilaterals over Washington. And right there, you can read all the people in the current administration that have the trilateral commission, you know, in their background, Anthony Blinken, Susan Wright, Eric Schmidt, John Podesta. And now we've just got a new trilateralist appointed by Biden to head the World Bank, a guy named, if I'm pronouncing his name right, Ajay Banga. And this is why no matter how much things change, everything seems to stay the same uh, because you have the same people in the same positions in both Republican and Democrat administrations. Remember, it was Brzezinski that started that trilateral commission in the 1970s, and he populated it, uh, populated the entire Carter administration. And since then, any administration we've ever had, Republican or Democrat, has been populated by the exact same people. And these are people that basically believe that one worldism or globalism, you know, is the solution to our problems. Um, and so here it's more of the same as we now have a new trilateralist appointed to head the World Bank. All UK citizens should receive digital ID cards, Blair and Haig say. We played an audio clip of this the other day uh, on TV show, I think. Um, but there you go. All UK citizens should receive digital ID cards. Tony Blair. Tony Blair, who would definitely be on my shortlist and has been for a while. Jimmy D. Young had him on the shortlist, too, for the Antichrist. Um, he's the one pushing a Warren World religion through the Tony Blair Faith Foundation. Rick Warren had him at his uh, saddleback, quote, church, end quote, a few years ago, gave him an award. Uh, Tony Blair is a Fabian socialist. Socialism, Fabian socialists gave birth to the Labor Party. They want world government by their own writings. Uh, they're for eugenics, the Fabian socialists, you know, Bertrand Russell, the rest of them. So uh, he's, I think, trying to work behind the scenes to cut a deal between the Jews and the Palestinians. So, you know, there's a lot of things that Tony Blair is doing that would put him on the short list of the Antichrist, along with 
Emmanuel Macron, uh, and, you know, a few others I would put on there. But um, I'm not saying they are. I'm just saying if I had a short list today, these are the guys I'd be keeping my eye on. Thoughts? Yeah, well, the article talks about how these guys were supposedly political rivals or political opponents. Uh huh. And then now, now when they're out of office and they're free to write their op-eds and their position papers and tell us what they really think, it's like, uh, just fooling. We were never rivals. We were always on the same page. And what we were always promoting is uh, a digital ID for everybody and many other, you know, uh, control freak things. 